Donna. Okay, we are recording. Terrific, thank you. And um, it, it usually doesn't come up during these kinds of sessions, but if anybody has anything personal that they want to share at some point or a question and they don't want, their, they don't want it on the, on the record, um, that's fine, let us know. We'll pause the recording for that time and then put it back on after. Uh, but usually that doesn't happen during a book club session, but if it does, you know what to do. Okay, so um, I just want to say one or two quick things about the logistics. Um, one is once you have a lot of people uh, on the line, it, there's a tendency for a lot of background noise. So please mute yourself um, on Zoom so we don't hear the dogs barking and the phone going off and all the other stuff in the background. Um, and we'll remind you if, you, if, if we call on you and you start talking and you're still muted, we'll remind you of that. Um, also, it helps to have earphones if you have a pair uh, that reduces the echo uh, that we sometimes hear. Um, and also just makes the sound quality, both of hearing your speaking as well as your listening, it improves that. Um, and also feel free to use the chat box to communicate with each other, um, but we're not monitoring it. So if you wanna say something to uh, mostly David during the session, uh, you will need to raise your hand. And if you're on the phone and we won't see your hand, then you do need to speak up. Um, but otherwise, we're not, we don't have someone monitoring the chat box. So other than those logistics, I want to thank you all for joining us. I hope you enjoy the sessions. And with that, I will turn it over to David Gallup, who needs to unmute himself. There you go. Take it away, David. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming today to talk about uh, Gary Davis's memoir, My Country is the World, which uh, uh, tells about his life during uh, before World War II and during World War II, and of course, mostly after World War II, in which he was a, a bomber pilot uh, and was very became very disillusioned with the whole war system, which forced him to kill. Um, and so before we go into sort of an open discussion today, um, I would like to show a couple pictures of Gary and then tell a few anecdotes that relate to Gary. We'll talk more anecdotes about Gary, probably the third session on the book in December. Um, but I just wanted to mention that today is World Mental Health Day, which is important to note because many people who come back uh, from war or have been in war uh, really are affected uh, mentally. Their mental health is, is uh, dramatically impacted. I mean, during World War II or after, people called it shell shock. Now we might call it post-traumatic uh, stress uh, from the war, and it can dramatically impact your life. It causes many uh, former service people to kill themselves. Um, so it, it's important that we think about that as we're also, as we're reading this book and what was Gary's mental state. And you can he even talks about that a little bit in the book. But today's not only World Mental Health Day, it is uh, Friedhof Nansen's birthday. Friedhof Nansen uh, was an explorer, a zoologist uh, from Norway, and he was actually the um, first uh, high commissioner for refugees under the League of Nations. And he created a Nansen passport office, which issued the Nansen after his name, the Nansen passport, or that's what people called it. Um, and that passport helped a lot of stateless people and refugees, especially after World War I, between like 1922 and, and 1930. Uh, and actually, the uh, Nansen and Nansen passport office won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1922 for creating this uh, predecessor to the world passport. And so the world passport is really the, the successor to the Nansen passport. Um, so, and of course, the, since the Nobel uh, Prizes just came out recently, I thought that was apropos to mention uh, Friedhof uh, Nansen and, and his work that led partly to uh, the idea for creating uh, the world passport to continue to help refugees um, and stateless people. So before we go into the open discussion, I'm gonna share my screen and show you a few pictures of Gary and then uh, tell you a few anecdotes. So let me do that. Okay. So here's Gary. Is every, can everyone see that? Yes. I, I can't see you now, so hopefully that means hopefully yes, yes, it is yes, visible. Yes, okay. yes, and we're all on mute. <laughs> just, so. want, just want to make just want to make sure. Yeah. Okay. So here's Gary. This is actually at Occupy DC back in uh, 2000. Uh, well, 
what was it, 11 or 12? Um, and he is wearing his World Guards uniform, similar to what he mentions in the book about having a World Citizen yeah. uniform. And Gary was really well known for wearing a leather uh, bomber jacket, uh, his leather jacket that he wore, you know, uh, probably during uh, his training in the Air Force uh, and then afterwards. And, so, and he mentions this in the book that, that people knew who he was just maybe by his his jacket, what he was wearing. He always felt it was important to sort of dress the part, dress the part of a world citizen. He, Gary was not um, a pacifist, really. He was, an, he was an activist, which meant that he would be willing to uh, work in a world peace or world police force, sort of like the Satyagraha movement of Mahatma Gandhi, uh, to take action uh, to uh, r uh, raise the idea that we need to work together under law and, and that will be the consequence of that will be peace. So here he is at, at Occupy wearing his World Guards uh, uniform, uh, which WSA still has uh, um, now, which at some point when we have a World Citizen Museum, we'll put that on display. Um, of course, he's holding the book, My Country is the World, which is the book we're talking about, and, and his world passport, the other version of the world passport, which says world government on the cover. Um, Gary, for Gary, he always talked about the power of appearances, you know, what, what we present to the public. So, of course, whenever, and you'll remember this from when, you know, as you read the book, whenever he, almost whenever he did anything important, he would put out a press release so the public would know why he was doing it because he took some actions that you know, sometimes might have been looked upon as um, strange or unusual or the uh, people would not really get it um, unless the, he had put out the press release ahead of time so not only did he want to work with the media but he also wanted them he also wanted to appear as a world citizen he was I, you know, I worked for Gary, with Gary, for Gary and with Gary for almost 25 years before he died and he was always on meaning he was always playing the, the role of a world citizen. Um, and even in, even in his, and, and Melanie and Arthur can attest to this, even when he was off, meaning not in front of the public, he, it was always on his mind. He would always talk about it. Um, and uh, we, we had long rides. Uh, I mean, I had my long ride home from work and I, that would be when I would talk to him on my speakerphone uh, at the end of the day. And I, I'll tell more about that maybe uh, on our third session when I talk about anecdotes, but he was always thinking about what, it, what does it mean to be a world citizen? What does it mean to uh, establish world law, to have, to, to have a peaceful world? So he, would, he always said to me, David, look, I am not for world citizenship. I am not for world government. Uh, if you're for something, for a cause, maybe you'll pay some uh, organization or interest group uh, you know, a, a membership fee, but then it's as if you're letting someone else do the work. So for him, he wasn't for world citizenship, he claimed it and he exercised it. He was a world citizen and he worked at the world citizen government that he founded. And of course, uh, over the years, uh, he established and then I've helped, I've helped to reaffirm the legal basis for that, uh, for that citizenship, which we can talk at some point over the next couple sessions, if you'd like. So uh, for him, once again, uh, it's, it, it was important, uh, the, uh, you know, his appearance. So now I'd like to just show you a couple other pictures and start an, uh, a really quick anecdote, and then I'll go into another anecdote after this. And unfortunately, at short notice, I could not, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, I want to blow this up just a little bit. Uh, and one more. That's about as good, clear as it's going to get. But anyway, there was a, a, not long after I started working at World Service Authority, there was a, a fellow who came into our office in a uniform. It happened to be a Canadian Mountie uniform and a beret. And he was a very you know, small man. He was maybe four foot 11. And he came from Peru. And um, by, the, by the time I met him, he was not that cogent because actually he had been hit by uh, a truck in, in his hitchhiking because he had actually hitchhiked from um, Peru to the US and even into Canada uh, just with two tools, his world passport and his Canadian Mountie uniform. And he, as I said, he was a very small individual, but because he was wearing this uniform, 
he had to get, you know, people would say, oh, I guess I should pick him up. He, you know, he's done some service, you know, it, it, you know, for the military or something, or, or he's some kind of a government official. So his appearance was what allowed him that and the, the tool of the world passport allowed him to leave Peru, you know, on foot really, except for getting, you know, hitchhiking along the way and make his way all the way up to U.S., uh, where he was deported once, sent back down to Peru, and was able to come back up and even make it all the way into Canada, where he was uh, working on trying to get asylum in Canada. And, and I have to say, just like Gary, uh, he knew the importance of presenting himself in a way that would show some kind of authority. Uh, and that's what he did. Uh, so I, I was lucky to get to meet him. But like I said, by the time I met him, his, his cogency was, was, was not there because he had had sort of a severe brain injury. Uh, anyway, but he, but uh, wearing that beret and wearing that Canadian Mountie uniform, which I don't even know where he got it, maybe at a thrift store somewhere in, in Peru, he was able to make it uh, twice, like I said, up, up to Canada. Um, so let me stop uh, sharing my screen. And then I, I want to tell you also another quick anecdote that pertains to me, but pertains once again to what I learned from Gary working with him. And then we'll move into an open discussion about, about the first, at least the first half of my country is the world. Um, so early on when I, uh, I was really lucky when I first came to work at World Service Authority in, in 1992, um, I got the chance to travel to Geneva, Switzerland. There was a world court project going on, which was to look at the threat and use of nuclear weapons and to see if there could be a case brought before the um, International Court of Justice to determine is, is the use or threat of nuclear weapons illegal. And that's a whole other story, which I'm not going to go into, but that's what brought me to, to Europe. Um, and while I was there, since it was only a couple months after having first started working at World Service Authority, Gary wanted me to meet um, his, his uh, ex-wife, uh, Esther, in, in Strasbourg in France, um, and a few other people. I got to meet a lawyer named Bavo Kuhl, who was in Brussels. Bavo Kuhl actually established Avocats Sans Frontières, Lawyers Without Borders. So um, Gary, of course, you know, being who he was, having been world famous, you know, at 26, having camped out at the Palais de Shiloh in Paris, he, he, knew, so, he knew so many people, uh, and so many people knew him, and, and to work with people like Bavo Kuhl at Lawyers Without Borders was pretty amazing. But anyway, so I was traveling a little bit around Europe and made the side trip to Strasbourg. Uh, where the European Parliament was uh, is uh, uh, established, and so one afternoon, um, I decided it was a free uh, free afternoon that I had. I was going to go take a tour of the European Parliament. So it was late afternoon; it was probably about three or four in the afternoon. Uh, so I showed up, uh, you know, uh, signed in, and then um, there was only about five or six of us on the tour. And the tour guide, the first thing she did was to ask the people, you know, uh, who were there. Where, where were they from? So she went around and I was like the last person sort of in the, in the line of people, you know, waiting for the tour. And so everyone, pretty much everyone was either from France or from Germany, because uh, it was, you know, in Strasbourg. So right sort of there at the, at the border. And then she got to me. And she, so she said, D'où venez-vous? Where, you know, where, where are you from? And I said, la planète Terre. Je viens de la planète Terre. I'm from planet Earth. And she's like, oh, bon, ben, mais oui, nous sommes tous de la planète Terre, mais, mais d'où venez-vous? You know, but yes, of course, we're all from planet Earth, but, but really, you know, where are you from? Um, so I said, well, je suis citoyen du monde. I'm a world citizen. Uh, she, she's like, oh, but she really wanted, wanted to implore to find out exactly where I was from. So I said, bon, okay. Uh, so I took out um, my world citizen card and showed it to her. So she took it in her hand. She looked at it. She, she had a like smirk on her face. She handed it back to me. And then she sort of leaned over to me and whispered in my ear, because I guess she didn't really want to hear the, have the rest of the people on the tour hear this. But she said, okay, um, I'd like to get one of those. After the tour, can you tell me how I can get one? I said, well, of course. Um, <laughs> so it was sort of really kind of uh, funny to me that she gave so much emphasis or credence to an ID card. Um, than more to the human than to the human standing there in front of her. She was refusing to hear my human voice and to see my um, humanity uh, right there. Uh, she she didn't want to take my word for it. But when I showed her the the world citizen card, the plastic plasticized card, um, then the, she was happy because she could rely on some kind of document. But we as we all do, I have the right to political choice. I have the right to choose my own allegiance. 
And if I want to give my allegiance to humanity and the earth, I have the right to do that, as, as we all do. Um, and uh, when sh rejecting my, my claim of being a, you know, a world citizen or, or being from planet Earth, it would be like telling George Washington, you cannot be an American or you are not an American. And of course, uh, you could try to do that. You might you know, kill him, you, you might try to detain him, but that's not going to stop George Washington from claiming uh, his right to political choice. Um, and that's the same with world citizenship. Um, we have the right to choose this framework of identity and to build a system of world law that is a corollary to that identity. So anyway, my, my, my little story here, my little anecdote was to say that, that I, I've found in my work at World Service Authority similar experiences to Gary where you want to present yourself in a certain way or you want to be, play the role of something and you get challenged if it's not the status quo or if it's something unusual. Uh, but it's it's fun, and you can tell. And and Esther, uh, his ex-wife in the movie, uh, you know, she she mentions, you know, if Gary didn't have a sense of humor, if he hadn't been, uh, you know, a comedian, this would have really really been hard for him, I think. And if he hadn't had that those skills as an actor, uh, to to be the world citizen for the world. Uh, and of course, one thing Gary always said, and I think it's important to say, is that um, you can claim world citizenship, but you do not give up any other allegiance that you might have. It's just adding that higher allegiance to humanity uh, and, and the earth. And I wouldn't ne even say, necessarily say it's a higher allegiance. It's just a different allegiance to, to the world and to everyone in it. And, and Gary sees that as an equation uh, for world peace. So anyway, that's, that's, that ends my, my <laughs> little bit of uh, comments and, and anecdotes to, to start this off. So I, I really kind of feel like for, for me, uh, I've always enjoyed the book club here when we open up the floor and anyone can uh, make comments. It doesn't have to even be a question, just a comment about you know, what you thought about, especially the first half of the book, which is what we'll be talking about yeah. today, your thoughts of Gary. Uh, go ahead, Bob. D David, but before, before we throw it open to the group, if you can oh, we've very do this. briefly. Yes, that, well, that was one of the things I was going to say. So <laughs> before, but before we throw it open to the group, I, I, I wanted to both decide when we were going to do the sign. So we'll do that next. But also for those who may not have read the full email or, or what have you, if you would briefly, uh, I guess, after the sign, after the photos, say um, how many sessions you had in mind for this, um, how much reading per session, you, you put a study guide together, if you would say something about that. Sure. Uh, so we know the logistics that you have in mind. And also, let me say, uh, remind people again to mute their phones. I'm hearing very prominently someone's heavy breathing uh, in the background. So if you would just make sure your phone is muted. Thank you. And it's star, star six, I think, or just mute your phone if you're on the phone. So either star six or just push mute on your phone. Oh, go, right, right. Go to mute on Zoom yeah. if you're on Zoom. Just, yeah. yeah. I think so we're doing this now. Fine. Is that the yeah, that's uh, great? Let's do the sign okay. while we're all here. Hey, please give me one minute. One minute. I'm I'm writing. Okay. Ninja. Forget so I forget it. So I'm writing. Okay. So so while while um, Anisha is writing, do you want to tell us what you had in mind in terms of logistics? Yeah, sure. So the, we thought about having three sessions for this. It could be maybe fewer, but I think it we'll have enough to talk about, I hope. So this first session uh, will be an open session to discuss basically the first half of the book, the first nine chapters, um, whatever thoughts or questions you might have about Gary's initial actions. The second session in November, I'm hoping to talk about the last half of the book um, and overall impressions of the book. And then really see how we, uh, as members of Citizens for Global Solutions, can take what Gary did, his bold actions, and, and can we recreate some kind of bold action like that now? I mean, maybe not during the pandemic. That's going to be hard, maybe. But as soon as we have our vaccine and all and can be out in the world, what could we do? And what could we take from his use of media to promote World Federation and world citizenship? So that's a sort of a bigger discussion, I hope, to help Citizens for Global Solutions. And then the th third session, and this is why Melanie mentioned it would be important if you haven't seen The World is My Country, the film, to see that film uh, either before the next session or definitely before the third session, because at that point, Arthur and Melanie will be uh, conducting a discussion about how the uh, book uh, relates to the film, what, you, you know, what was the differences between the two, because Arthur, Melanie, and I are thinking about creating another book 
uh, called The World is My Country. So taking, taking the, you know, Gary's memoir, redoing it, adding some new photos, doing a forward and all. And so it would be useful to hear all of your input and suggestions on what we can do uh, with that book. And then the very last part of that third session would be for me, for um, Arthur and for Melanie, to tell some fun anecdotes and stories from having worked with uh, Gary Davis for, you know, many years. And, and you know, so that will also elucidate some of what we talked about in the book. So those are the three sessions that I was thinking about. It. Thank you, David. And, and your, um, your study guide? Oh, yes. So there is a study guide, um, which is about eight pages. It's about 12 pages with, with the suggested answers that, that I have. Uh, but yeah, there's a study guide that I emailed out to everybody. If you don't have it, I can email it to you. Uh, but the study guide will hopefully help us if there's a lull in our conversation, um, whether it's today or over the next couple sessions. It, I can ask some of these questions about the book that, that are more personal. Uh, to you as to what you, you know, you think about maybe nationalism or how do we deal with war or how did, did Gary deal with war in, in, a, in a way that will change people's minds uh, about it either back then or even now. So it's uh, questions for contemplation and, and that study guide uh, will hopefully help us here. And I'm hoping that we have more book club meetings and also uh, to use this for as a study guide for the, the film too, uh, when we share it around the, the, the country and the world. Thank you. <laughs> so now, we can, I guess we're ready to do the, our signs. Great. Okay, is everyone, um, Tom Sachs or Gail, are you gonna turn your video on or not? And if you don't have the, a sign, you could hold up the book. What's up, Simon? I see Simon waving. Where did you, where did you get that World Parliament uh, printing? Where from? I forgot. Well, just hold up the book. I sent it out as an attachment with instructions, but I, see. Well, I missed that. Okay. Okay. All right. Everybody smile. One, two, three. Smile. I hope that worked. Let me see. I have to paste it in and see if it worked. Yes, it worked. Great. Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah, you're all going to be on the cover of the New York Times tomorrow. <laughs> <That's what it laughs> well, so before I ask any questions or, or make any other comments, since I've now taken up almost a half hour here, um, well, I would like to open the floor and see, uh, you know, first impressions of the first half of Gary's memoir. Tom, and we'll and we'll we'll do a stack. So if, raise your hands if you want to talk. Tom, go ahead. Yeah. So you're going to take take the stack first. Or do you want me to? Uh, um, I'll try to. Okay, so I've okay, got So wait. if you're interested, raise your hand. Okay. And when David calls your name, put your hand down. So Tom, Donna, and Bob, right? And Anisha. There are, there, are other, hand. there are other hands. Anisha and David. David Auden. Okay, good. Great. Okay. So Simon. Tom, oh, and Simon. Simon. Okay. Okay, go, go ahead, uh, Tom. Wait, Tom, you're, Tom, you're on mute. Okay, it's, it's Tom. Uh, uh, on page 19 of the first chapter is a very important idea for our movement. Okay, thanks. <laughs> it, it, <clears throat> he, he said, he writes, there had been a point at which American founding fathers had declared it, so literally declared the themselves as American. Are, are you hearing me okay? Yes. Yeah, there, there are other people talking who are not on mute. Would everybody else go on mute so we don't hear background noise? Thank you. The lower left-hand corner, you can click the mute microphone icon. <clears throat> on, on page 19 of the first chapter, is something very important for our movement. <clears throat> There's been a point at which American founding fathers had declared it and literally described themselves as Americans. <clears throat> and that's the, we don't have a good word for the world as an identity world citizen is, is, is just as bland as saying I'm an American citizen. We need a word that says I'm a, I'm a worlder, I'm an earthling. We need something that is an identity word that says what I am. So yeah. we need to search for, the, for that word and I don't have a good suggestion, but it's not- Can I idea. jump in? Uh, can I jump in on that? Uh, sure. Buckminster Fuller uh, coined the term earthians 
And we actually plan a, a future movie called Earthians. Uh, and I, I don't know, I like Earthians. What's wrong with that? Does everybody that, that, like that's Earthians? Getting there. That's getting there. That's the idea. <laughs> I mean, the only other choice uh, basically is, is Worldians, but Earth, if the name of the planet is Earth. I mean, world could be any world, but this is Earth, so we are Earthians. Earthians, okay. Well, that's, thanks. Ron Glossop has a comment. Go ahead, Ron. Okay, so, so we, 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 we I, Bob, yeah, if we can maybe let people, we have a queue, so to, to avoid chaos, we need to follow that or else we'll have people waiting and everyone else jumping in while the people who are waiting uh, will be getting more frustrated. Right. So, um, so let's keep the queue, but you can add to that if you want to, David. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, I was, I was, if there's, I'm, I'm just not sure if it's right to do it this way, but if there's a specific comment to a particular question, perhaps before we move on to another yeah. question, we could get to those. I don't know if that makes sense to do it that way. We, I can't hear you. It, it's, it's up to you. It's more difficult to facilitate. Right. Usually the way that's done is if someone asks a question, like I have a question for you and you and Arthur and Melanie, that would be whatever. But, but every, every comment will trigger many other comments. So if we go with that, it will constantly destroy the order we set up. That's okay. inevitable. Okay. Thank you. So, so I guess I guess it makes sense to go in the to go in the queue, and then if you have a comment about a previous statement or question, then then bring it up when when your hand comes up. So that makes sense. So I guess we should go to Donna next. Uh, thanks. I was also going to point to that page, uh, well, page eighteen, and um, to, to his critique of the World Federalist Movement. I think is also really important for us to hear that you know, he was frustrated that the World Federalists just kept talking. And to some extent, I mean, that, that criticism rings true to this day. Um, so I think the, the, the desire to move beyond talking um, and to, um, to do something else really, really rings true for me. Um, another thing I wanted to comment on, I, I loved the, his, importance about smiling at, from his father, you know, of, of make sure you keep it simple and smile. I mean, to me, that, those are two other important things for world federalists to hear. Keep it simple and smile. And often, you know, we go into long discourses and heavy things and, and it's like, just keep it simple and smile. I, I love it. Um, and um, I, I also love um, later on, where he just talks about a majority of the po on page 79, a majority of the population registered themselves as world citizens and pledged their vote to a, wor a people's world assembly. It's like, I can't believe we just hung up a sign and took our picture. I feel like that's what we're doing. We are pledging ourselves. And, and um, I, I look forward to the discussion at the end about how we might be able to use his ideas and his examples. And, and do something that just puts a stake in the ground and says, we are world citizens. I, I'm not as hung up on having one word. I, I'm really good. I, I'm a little worried about Earthians being a little funky. I mean, to me, just saying we are world citizens and we, we, you know, we want a world, a parliament it works, but I'm happy to anyway, to adjust. But anyway, that's all I wanted to say. I love, I love the book. It's just fun reading. And thank you. Thank, thank you, Donna. Bob, Bob, you're next in the, in the queue. Thank you. Um, so I, I had a question and a comment. The question is to you, David, the author, and Melanie, um, and then a comment. So, uh, it's, so my, my question is, it seems that several of us have been drawn to what, what Gary said on page 18 and 19, and I was too. Um, there was another, another uh, aspect of it, though, that really drew me in. Um, when he says, uh, this is near the bottom of 18, to eliminate war, I concluded, one would first have to eliminate nations. True federation would accomplish this, but no nation was willing to, no, yeah, no nation was willing to dissolve itself. So it looked to me, that's why, you know, and this is my question, is my interpretation true or correct? 
it looks like that's why he, he felt World Federation was not the answer, that no nation would be willing to merge into a World Federation. So he said, I felt therefore that the Federation of Nations was impossible and that if anything was going to be federated, it would need to be the people and the very, the very people who made up the nations. So for me, as I read it, that was the essential insight that Gary had, that the nations would not give up sovereignty and join a greater whole and then, um, and then you know, and federate. So I turned to the people instead. And then he goes into what the founding fathers of this country did and all that stuff. Then what, what Donna said is also correct. It follows by him saying that the, um, that the World Federalists were talking about this impossible thing. That, that the nations would not do. And instead, there is something we can do. We can declare ourselves world federalists or sorry, world citizens and move from there. So that, that's my question. And is that correct? And if any of you would, would pontificate on it. Um, but then let me, let me just make one quick comment and then we'll go back to the question. Is that um, in my studies of, of movement building, and a number of you know I've recommended uh, this book called This is an Uprising, which is a fabulous book on movement building. Um, they, uh, the authors there look at various social movements and conclude that there's two kinds of actions. Uh, there's what they call symbolic, and it would be like what Gary did, the Montgomery bus boycotts, Gandhi salt march, all of those big symbolic things that get a lot of media coverage and, you know, really out there. And then there are the other kinds of things which, which they, they call instrumental, which is the more kind of, you know, little pieces of stuff, building organizations, doing, you know, what we in the movement kind of call incremental things. Uh, we'll get a treaty passed. We'll do a specific thing. And, and what, what, what these folks argue is any strong movement needs both. You know, you need both the symbolic, the big, big attention grabbing stuff and the instrumental the smaller, you know, building the infrastructure and getting laws passed and all that stuff. And I, I want to agree with what I, I believe what Donna, the point she said before, and you too, David, is we've been really lacking in our movement on the symbolic, and we need to do that. So, um, so that's okay. it. So I'll go back to the question, David, to well, you. Okay, well, so Bob, I've got five other people in line here, which are Anisha, David, uh, Simon, okay. Ron, so and you Brad. Could, you, could take, so, you could take those and speak to it later if you yeah, want. Yeah, and so then, yeah, I think I'd rather go to everyone's question yes. and, and they may have Fine. answers for you too. And then, I, but I do have a, an answer for you, but let's Great. go to Thank the you. next I have in line, ahead, Anisha. On. Anisha. Thank you very much. First of all, I want to thank uh, Mr. David. Thank you for the book. I covered this, so um, at 20, three page, uh, one line caught my attention and really I felt a real hot pain. The line is, now I am stateless. I don't want to break French laws. What shall I do? So no papers means we are not human beings. So uh, after thinking a lot, I thought that this is the rule of the society. Country means society. And if you study the Stone Age civilization, from Stone Age civilization, um, leaders of the society are solving the problems of the society. And from that, country started to grow up. And what's wrong with Mr. Uh, Gary? He, um, world citizenship is a very nice concept but he broke the rules of recognized society. That's highly appreciated. But, the, but what's wrong? The wrong thing is we don't have any recognition. World citizenship, we need to recognize this. Unless every society recognize this, um, uh, this movement will face hurdles after hurdles. For example, one, um, sentence I noted from Mr. David, you can claim world citizenship. Yes, I can. But in India, if I claim world citizenship, then I have to surrender my Indian citizenship. Um, 
we cannot uh, hold dual citizenship like America or United Kingdom. That's the problem. So to break this barrier, according to me, I think we need advocacy and a world treaty. That's all. Okay, great. Oh, and before we, just real quick, uh, Ron Glossop, uh, I know you can't see us, but yes. with your phone, if you could just lower your phone because we can, we can hear you breathing. Just oh. lower, lower it away from your mouth, I think. Well, or, you can mute, or you can mute your phone. Maybe. Well, as a matter of fact, I was waiting to have a chance to talk. I thought it was in line. I think you are in line. Yes. Gonna call on you. David, occasionally, would you restate the line so everyone knows where they are in the line? Look, David apparently froze. It looks uh -oh. like David Ron, go ahead, because David's frozen. So go ahead, Ron. David's frozen. Oh, My back. comment is that the academics already have a word that they use for people with our outlook. You're called a cosmopolitan. So that is a word that's already used in academic circles for people who think in terms of globalism. Also, I think another possibility that hasn't been mentioned, as most of you know, I am very enthusiastic about Esperanto. I don't think that we can continue to just keep using English and expect everybody to say, oh, English is the world language. I think we have to use the world language. We have to be an Esperantist. We have to say, me estes mond civitano. That's how you would say it in Esperanto. I also, while I have the line, want to mention that on pages 72, 73, you can see that in those photographs, there's a copy of the documents, and very often there's something in Esperanto. Uh, for example, on page 73, you'll see there's a section G. A R A V A, Grava, that's Esperanto for important, and under it is the Esperanto uh, translation of the English above. And then on the next page, uh, um, page, uh, on the next page, there's a <clears throat> note uh, in English, and then noto in Esperanto. So, uh, and Gary himself was very much aware of Esperanto and either was using it himself or had someone else using it for him. Thank you. Uh, hey, sorry, everybody. Um, my computer crashed, believe it or not, but I'm, I'm speaking to you from my phone. So I have next in line uh, Dave Otten. And, and I'm sorry, David, let me cut in. David Gallup, would you read everybody who's in line so people know? Yeah, who, so ne you, next, yeah. In, next in line is David, Simon, well, Ron already went. So David, Simon, and Barrett. Great, thank you. Okay, just a few quick comments. First, I'm very appreciative of Gary Davis starting the World Service Authority and the uh, World Passport, and also for David Gallup for uh, getting me one uh, when CGS had our annual meeting in St. Louis a number of years ago. And I've been able to use my world passport uh, several times in my recent travels. Um, and I think that's important that it actually be used. When I was vacationing with my family in Costa Rica, I was able to get a Costa Rica stamp on my world passport. Uh, two years ago, when I went to the World Parliament of Religions in Toronto, Canada, I was able to get a Canadian stamp on my world passport. The problem was getting back in the United States after the parliament, I could not get a US stamp for my world passport. Uh, so they re apparently refused to do that at, at this point. Uh, second comment is on page 18, uh, Gary mentions two very important books that are uh, part of a history of world federalism, Cord Myers' Peace, Our Anarchy, and Emery Revis's book, The Anatomy of Peace. Uh, so he apparently uh, knew the arguments of World Federation from those two books. The third thing I, was, uh, uh, I noted in reading the first half of this book is that he certainly was a name dropper, having Albert Einstein as an honorary chairman of one of the uh, sessions that he conducted, 
also working very closely with the French philosopher Albert Camus, and then meeting directly with the Indian Prime Minister Nehru. So those are big names in world in recent world history, and, and Gary was a part of all that. Thank you, David. Um, so, I, so I I have Simon next. Uh, <clears throat> I was very impressed with Gary's um, courage. Um, in his life and work and his ability uh, to create some kind of an answer uh, to um, isolate himself from you know, different parts of the world, whether it was France or Germany or Switzerland, um, uh, where there were rules. And uh, somehow he was able to um, have people believe in him and let him move on. I was also impressed by the amount of suffering, uh, physical suffering he put up with. He had uh, very little possessions. He had uh, uh, difficult places to sleep. Uh, he was cold at night. He uh, depended on other people and it was very difficult for him to move around with his belongings uh, being carried by him without any a vehicle to help him, uh, a carriage even. Uh, and this is very, very, very unique. Uh, I have not read the story of anybody else who has something like that. And uh, the other thing was he was uh, uh, born of a uh, Jewish father and an, um, and an uh, Irish mother. And uh, it looked like he had taken his Irish mother's uh, religion uh, Christianity, which was uh, important uh, to discover, and he believed in Jesus and the Bible, which he carried with him, uh, which was rather uh, interesting. Um, and yet, um, he persisted in his travels with great difficulty, whether it was the United Kingdom, that England, uh, or, uh, or Scotland, and or the United States, the difficulties he faced uh, he was able to somehow believe in himself that he could extricate himself with, through these difficulties. So he was a very, I think, uniquely uh, courageous and creative individual that I've ever read uh, a, a life story of. Um, the other question I have is about this, uh, what uh, Bob Flax mentioned about a, a strong movement need. The, the title of the book, I missed that. If I could get that title slowly so that I could yeah. write I'll, 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 put, I'll put it in the chat box. I'll put but it in the chat that box. won't help me. I, I'd like to read it now if you have a moment. Sure. What it is, what the title is, slowly. Sure. Yes, this is, this is an uprising, is the name of it. This is an uprising. It's, um, it's in my opinion, the best book I've ever read on movement building. And the authors? Uh, two brothers, the last name is Eng Engler, E-N-G-L-E-R, E-N-G-L-E-R. And I will put it in the chat box as well. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Bob. Sure. So, Simon, was that your comments for now? Yes, thank you. Oh, okay, great. So, Barrett, you're next. You're still on mute, Bart. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Well, I'll try to be brief. Uh, Maybe difficult because I'm struggling with uh, so many thoughts that have crossed my mind reading this book. I'll try to focus on just one idea in here. But for me to do that, I have to go back to my history. See, my father was born in a very tiny place in the uh, western part of India in the state of Gujarat. And he grew up there, went to school there. Necessity brought him to the big city of Bombay. And after a few years, he kind of expanded his world from a tiny village to that of the big city 
And when there were exchanges between people in that tiny village and my father, already a sense of engulfing occurred. And here I was born in that big city and I went to a national boarding school. So I met with not only the big city, but all of the people of India. And so my sense expanded from that of the Bombay and Western India to that of, and in our common discussions, I always thought of myself as Indian rather than, you know, Maharashtrian or Gujarati or, or whatever from our region. And then I come to America. And when I came to America, people initially started thinking of me as a foreigner, you know, an immigrant who has come in as a student. And as more and more I got into it, and I would go visit India, they started thinking of me as an American. <laughs> oh, you talk like an American, you know, you're, you're really an American. I come here, oh, you're not American, you're not one of us, you're, you're an Indian. So in a sense, it's like an orphan who got a best of the world sometimes and got the worst of the world sometimes because nobody wants to include you as one of them. Anyway, uh, many years have passed and I suddenly realized that all of us kind of keep wearing more and more clothes, you know, building up identities, adding, adding, adding. And what stuck me at this one idea from Gary's book is this one line, the above restriction is hereby removed. And what that occurred to me was in a sense, we have restricted ourselves by putting all kinds of clothes on us. And we are kind of being, you know, cramped up. So the way perhaps to free ourselves is not so much to add, you know, from nationality to the world, so to speak, but let's start stripping. You know, let's get us out, uh, out of these things. And perhaps that's the wisdom, you know, that I feel uh, comes out of, you know, reading this uh, early part of the book. Uh, and uh, corollary to that, is the idea that also hit me. And, uh, and I think Donna or somebody brought it up that oftentimes these ideas which sort of impels us to wanna discuss all of these issues, we are kind of always thinking about talking about it. Whereas I kind of like the idea of Gary just saying, look, I don't want to talk about it. I just want to do it. And I think that move from action, you know, from thought and uh, grasping and understanding to action is something which I think CGS would uh, behoove CGS to really kind of propel itself and all of us with it. Uh, anyway, that's, I'll stop there. Thank you, Barrett. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, I was I was a little bit wary when I was asked by Ann Zill to come to the board of uh, be on the board of Citizens for Global Solutions because you know I, I was built in the in the um, framework of of Gary Davis of you know we need to take action and every day at World Service Authority every passport that we issue every legal letter that our legal department or legal brief that we send out. It's, it's like it puts a dent in the armor of the nation state, you might say it, it or it in, a, in a positive way, you could say it, it raises our, our awareness uh, of ourselves and, and the people we're helping uh, to that world level. So, so I, 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 you know, this is, this is why the, the hopefully much of the next session uh, in November, even after we finish the overall picture of the view of the book, um, we'll get to these questions of, um, how do we take action, uh, you know, through uh, as people who want to support World Federation, but also as world citizens. Um, Bob, my, uh, just to let you know, my computer is, is just coming back up again. So I cannot see, I can only see me and the, uh, myself and the other person who's actually talking. So I'm mm -hmm. not sure if other people have their hands up right now. Um, 
So if they do, I can't, until my computer okay. is fully so, back so, up, I can't. So, so David, do you mean we, we have reached the end of the queue that you have so far? So far, yes. Okay, great. Then we'll, we'll take another queue. I'm happy to keep that. I see Clara with her hand up. Anybody else want Carla, to get on the queue? Carla, oh, Carla May. I'm sorry. Carla, okay, Carla May. Carla May. Yeah. Terrific, thank you. Uh, anyone else who has not yet spoken who would like to get in? Okay, I see Gail. Anyone else who has not yet spoken before we take people for the second time? Going once, going well, twice. Well, Bob, I have a question. Did you get answers to your questions? You had asked a question that I don't think was answered. Right. Was no, it? No, 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 no. I'm assuming at the end, um, we'll, get you know, we'll stop a few minutes before and then David could address all the issues that came up. So let me again okay. see show of hands for who has not yet, who has not yet spoken. Um, who would like to? So I see Carla May, Gail, I see Lee, Lee Davis, anybody else who has not yet spoken? Going once, okay. Um, Arthur, uh, Arthur, Arthur. Okay, anybody else? Okay, then I'll take a show of hands for people who want to speak the second time. Uh, please raise your hand if you're there. Um, David, you'll get the whole last chunk of time. So I see <laughs> Barat, okay, I'll put myself in there too. Anybody else, second time? Okay, and we are ending. Um, okay, we still have about a half hour, so we're in good shape. Okay, so I have Carla May, Gail, Lee, Arthur, Barat, and myself, and probably by that time we'll have to turn it over to David to begin to wrap up. So thank you all. Let's start with Carla May. I'd like to just, uh, maybe I'm jumping ahead, but from my experience, uh, what, when we want to get this thing on the road and hit the ground running, something just as a light blinking in the back, I just offer the suggestion of repeat, 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 repeat. Now, Gary is very wise to this with his appearances and he, that he has to get press. If this is a marketing ploy. That's all I'm suggesting. And the idea is that people do not pay attention to something new until they have heard it seven times. So I'll just leave it with that. So that I say, repeat, repeat, repeat. We have to somehow do what the marketers do. We have got to get on stage. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to Gail. Um, well, I had a couple of comments about the book. Uh, one thing that struck me was that Gary referred to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights several times, you know, where he would um, point out, okay, there's this right and that right. And I have often thought, if only the Universal Declaration of Human Rights were implemented, you know, <laughs> we essentially would have accomplished what we want to accomplish. And yet nobody really pays much attention to it. I mean, there's some lip service occasionally, but um, I think you know, maybe it's something that we could um, push more seriously. The other just aside is that it was clear to me that Gary was a song and dance man because his conversations with some of the, the border people there sounded like what I would call banter, <laughs> you know, that it was quite, quite amusing and how, you know, oh, well, um, you won't let me in, but I'm not here of my own accord. I mean, you forced me to be here. So, but then, I mean, just, you know, kind of using the rules and regs and, and doing that kind of, um, uh, gymnastics with with language I thought was a lot of what made it amusing but yeah and yet it was it was also serious so anyway those are my comments great thank you Gail Lee Davis I had to unmute um, I was blown away by the conversations that he put in his uh, writing there isn't any worldly way that a person could remember all these long conversations that he had over the years with multiple people and he presents it as, just as if there was a tape recorder there and every word was captured. So I, I give him credit for re, reconstructing all this conversation that he had. 
And my other comment came, which I just cracked up at the top of page 116 when I was reading about his great efforts to get back to India or to go to India. And he had to go through China, I mean, through Canada, France and Switzerland, all of whom um, apparently had waived their visa requirements in order for him to make his flight to India. And then he finally says, uh, what about Washington? And the reply was all clear. I called the Justice Department. They rather gave me the impression that you can go to the moon for all they care. <laughs> and that just blew me away. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you, Lee. On to author. I'm so glad that uh, Shirley and Simon talked about kind of Gary's style and, and, and guts, which of course is what drew me to want to make a movie on him. And, uh, uh, and I don't know, Bob, you want it later or now, but you, you mentioned that uh, pointing out the, the paragraph where Gary talked about uh, that nations won't dissolve themselves. And he says later, there's no need to overthrow them. He doesn't think we should stop, you know, nations. He just says, we the people have to come together and do it. And I guess the key thing that really drew me to Gary's story is his, like people said, his guts to just jump in and, and do it. Uh, and I, I really think uh, the key thing for us to look at in the world right now is, is now there's just so many more tools for people to do that, that there weren't uh, back in those days. And now with the internet, we the people actually do have the power to, to create what we're calling, you know, you're the people powered planet, what Gary called. We could, you know, we can come together interactively and devise a new system that isn't win-lose democracy. Because, you know, he talks about, Sarazak says all these great lines about, it will never to work, you know, that, and he says that the, the mass movement, it will never work too, because the mass movement was mob rule. And, you know, what Gary talked about was not mob rule, not just everybody in the world votes, because obviously that would be mob rule and be a disaster, but something that really does reach inside each person and bring out the best and bring out an interactive way, he called it synergies, integrity. He worked for the last years of his life after this book, which back in 1960 on helping, you know, invent ideas about What's a new way that we people can govern our world from the bottom up? And so to me, that's our prime uh, objective. And that's what we do each week in our People Powered Planet podcast, which I hope you're all coming to. If you can just go to peoplepoweredplanet.com. It'll shortcut you there. Uh, and uh, really figure out how do we move a step beyond? Because, you know, federal, World Federalists, I, I joined World Federalists when I was in high school. And, you know, we've been doing this for years, begging and pleading the government leaders to, you know, Come together and, and fix things and we see how you know even if you make steps forward some other administration can come in and dash it and just how impossible it is to work inside that broken nation state system that is so dominated by as bob pointed out so well by the economic interests that were supposed to be under the people that come out on top because we're locked in those boxes called nation states and so i think the real key is that and and also just capturing, as was mentioned by Donna, the smile. Like Gary did it all with a smile. He said he never could have done it if, if, if he hadn't had that sense that this was a, a drama and that these, you know, these guys in uniforms coming to get him at the border with all their guns and really, that's all costumes, it's all sets, all designed to intimidate me. I'm gonna draw them into my game, not play theirs. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you, Arthur. And feel free, if you'd like, Arthur, to put into the chat box uh, the information about your podcast, if you have any links or anything about that. Thank you. And on to Bharat. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Oh, am I, am I, oh, okay, I'm- We can I'm hear you. Here. Okay, I can, okay. Yeah, I have a, I just want to expand on the idea that I brought up about this expansion and adding and adding. See, I'm also a physicist, and one of the things we've learned with all of our expansion and understanding of the universe, the more and more we go away from the Earth, we recognize how small and tiny we are. And in fact, we are just a little speck. And so as such, uh, this idea of who we are are really kind of inhabitants of this satellite that just swirling around the universe. And so that to me is an image that needs to become very much a part of our consciousness when we think about the world. And the, the thought I have is how 
totally contrary. I see our world here in the United States and I presume in other parts of the world too, where somehow with social media and all of these so-called internet excited things that Arthur talks about, how abusively they're being used to create false realities, you know, opinions become truths for groups of people and we no longer pay attention to the truth. So I think one of the other idea that we should put ourselves to kind of watch for is always seek the truth and use that as the kind of guiding principle rather than popularity, opinions and, and so on and so forth that I see happening all over in, in, in this election season that we are living through. Anyway, that's, that's all I have to say. Great, thank you, Bharat. I'm the last in line for this series, then I'm gonna check in with David Gallup to see if we wanna turn it over to him uh, to begin the wrap up or whether there's time for more people. So, so my, my couple of quick comments is first, um, kind of building on what David Orton said that uh, I'm envious of his statement that he was able to travel between uh, countries uh, with the world passport. I have tried three times since 9-11. I think the world's changed a bit since 9-11 and they've refused to stamp my passport each time, uh, just reporting. And my uh, department chair at Saybrook University where I teach, um, they not only uh, refused it, but they detained him in Canada uh, when he tried to use it. They actually brought him into a back office and kept him for several hours. Um, and he was shocked. He thought the Canadians are nice people. They would gladly, <laughs> you know, they would gladly honor it. And, and that was his experience. So that's point one. Point two, and this kind of is building on something Barack said a while ago about peeling off the layers of clothing and peeling off the identities. As I was reading that, in, in Gary's book, it struck me, I'm also a student of Buddhism, and it struck me how aligned that is, uh, whereas in Buddhism and perhaps many other religions, it really is getting beyond the small identities that I have to really, you know, getting down to spirit or getting down to what is the core truth. Uh, I mean, in Buddhism, there is no self. So we, we kind of build all the, you know, I'm a, I'm a, you know, a psychologist, I'm a this, I'm a that, that they're all kind of illusions in this world, uh, but there's a, a truth under that. And it seemed to me that Gary's work was very much aligned with the spiritual perspective. So that was my, my second comment. The last thing I wanna say is that, you know, while it's true that the strategy of CGS has largely been first to do public education, to get the word out. And we actually have a, some very exciting new ways we're planning for this year. And after the public is educated to then move to the second step of political action. Um, but it, it, it kind of falls on deaf, you know, our thinking was you need to get an educated public first. Even though that's the case, when I was reading that book, I was thinking, what could we do that's symbolic and that's big? So I'm not recommending this. I may have suggest, talked about it with one or two people, but I'll tell you my fantasy, um, which was to get a couple of hundred uh, world passports out there, hopefully even a couple of thousand to people who choreograph this. And at the very same time in major cities around the country, we all show up at the airport. We buy a ticket and show up in the airport for international travel with the world passport. We do what Gary did and alert the media, send out press releases that, you know, 500 world citizens are gonna to go to five different cities and try to board an airplane and then tell both the local and the national media and see what happens. So that was my, my fantasy of a symbolic action uh, that we could take. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll leave it there. Let me check in with David Gallup um, David, we've got about a little less than 20 minutes. Do you want all of that time to wrap up and respond to the different things? Or do you want me to take more people? You tell me. Well, it looks like Simon has a question. I would just, just to, to 
explain, what I'd like to do is, is go through most of those comments and, and give some replies, not necessarily yes. a perfect answer. And then I, I, but there's one last tiny little story that, that will relate to what Barat said, which will be the last thing I'd like to say, which could be at the very end of the, uh, of the meeting. So, right. I'll so I asked meeting. my question, I asked my question again, we have people yes. who may want to speak and sure. other people who put, who, who told me in the chat box that they want to speak. So yeah, Do I, you I, want me I would rather them ask their questions first and then I, I within 10 minutes, I should be able to answer. Okay, you, know, you, 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 okay, so at 20 so, after you want me to stop, correct? Uh, yeah, yeah, so Simon, okay. I think it was next. Okay, nine more minutes, I, I had, okay, you saw Simon, I saw Anisha, so let's start with Simon, then we'll go to Anisha, thank you. Go ahead, Simon. Yeah, the, uh, one of the solutions for uh, coming together into one world uh, and the difficulty that uh, sovereign states have in giving up their sovereignty is to create uh, uh, something like a world union where union, world union, W-U, uh, where there are supranational laws uh, which have to be obeyed in order to come together into a world union and uh, give up their national laws. In other words, not completely, but subordinate their national laws. So, for example, we have the example of the European Union's uh, seven countries, as you know, they work on this concept. They keep their own countries, with, uh, they keep their own countries, France or Germany and so on, and yet they obey supranational European Union new ro rules uh, in which they begin to cooperate and collaborate to create the kind of world we are looking for. Justice, harmony, peace, good jobs, good education. In fact, there's free education, free uh, transportation, free healthcare, things, you know, basic things that we are all dreaming about in, this, in our country here and having difficulty getting healthcare. So, Supranational laws, to repeat, uh, is a way to subordinate national laws, yet at the same time keep the national identity subordinated to the world union uh, higher uh, concept of living, working, collaborating together, like the idea that we have in the Citizens for Global Society and the Gary Davis has for a world, uh, uh, for a world, one united world. Thank Great. you. Thank you, Simon. We'll turn it over to Anisha. Just unmute yourself. Thank you, Bob. Uh, but I want to say, I want to continue um, with the supranational uh, point and UDH point um, to reply Gil and Mrs. Simon. So, um, but I want to focus, yes, UDHR uh, did not implement it properly. Um, if you read one article uh, written by me, um, UN Charter as World Constitution, you can find there are three types of countries. I'm not taking name of any country, but one type of countries are including UDHR as their preamble. One kind of uh, country, uh, countries, they are uh, saying that their national laws are above them international laws and other countries are sometimes following international laws, sometimes following their national laws above international law. So to solve this um, problem, if we consider UDHR as basic structure, um, because a basic structure of the constitution of international law, then um, it can solve all type of problems because Human rights is the main purpose. We are all human beings and our rights need to be established. Um, United Nation um, was built up for intercourse between states, but UDHR changed its, its nature. So if we focus on UDHR, then indirectly it is upholding the point of supranational power of United Nation and um, also, it can help to um, build our world federalism more faster, faster than um, if, we, if we follow any other process. So that's all. 
Great. Thank you, Anisha. We still have four minutes. I'll make a quick comment, and then if there's more time, we'll take other comments. Um, uh, staying on the same point, um, one of the problems, I, I, I think, with, with world federalists, that, that world federalists don't recognize, um, is that we, we often talk about you know, this principle of subsidiarity, so local things get handled on the local level, national on the national level, and then the world parliament would only handle that international stuff. Well, where is that true on the face of it? Let's say there's an international law that regulates, you know, uh, greenhouse gas emissions or something like that. Okay, obviously that's going to affect factories on the local level. Okay, so even though it, you know it's an international law and it's about the globe, about controlling greenhouse gas emissions on the global level it's going to hit at every level and we'll have economic impacts, job impacts. I mean, th you know, th there could be things that are at that level that have a major ripple effect going down. I and I think we, ha we as a movement haven't talked about that sufficiently. We talk about it as though the things up here are just up here and will have no effect below, but that's not at all true. A and I think we're going to have, um, you know, if we get bigger, and gain more momentum, um, we, that the opposition will bring that up strongly. Saying, you guys are just talking about it's that level, but no, I'm gonna lose my job if that international law gets passed. And that's gonna be a big deal. So that's something that we, we need to recognize and need to think about. You know, how do we relate to that? You know, so that, that's my piece. We still have two minutes if anybody wow. wants to All get right. in the final comment. I'll give it to Barat and then we'll turn it back to David. Go ahead, Bharat. Uh, taking a cue from what you just said, Bob, I have a thought about that. The way we can deal with this national, international, local, is really to change ourselves. So we need to create human beings that become global beings. And so as such, I think one of the major tasks we have is to create uh, opportunities and maybe educational and so on, social, that gets us all to think like we are all part of this global conclave. Uh, and once we have that, a person who gets a job, whose job depends on the, you know, uh, fossil fuel factory will recognize his or her responsibility because that person is going to think of the world as a whole as his or her own rather than just his or her own little community. So I, th I think the task is to, to have the individual focus on the individuals and how we can get them to be global and all of a sudden will have, you know, what we are seeking. That, that's the... Thank you, Bharat. And I think that's the perfect segue to bring it all back to David Gallup, who's going to have perfectly, you know, articulated wise answers to all of the questions that we raised. <laughs> so take it away, David. So just tell me if a fly lands on my head, so I'm, I'm not embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, so I'm going to I'll probably speak a little bit faster because I would like to sort of comment on and everything here that, that everyone said and give some replies. Of course, if we don't get to all of this now, we have two more meetings. So um, Tom said that he felt that the, the term world citizen maybe is, is not an appropriate term because it may be bland. Gary, of course, with most of what he did in his life, if not everything, sort of had a, a meaning behind it because if you look at the word citizen, that means having rights and duties within a particular communal framework. So when you add world in front of citizen, you're saying that your rights and duties go to the, the, the highest level that we can until we become maybe universal citizens because we meet some extraterrestrials. So world citizen for Gary was an important term because of world meaning like a system. It's not just like earth, which is environmental, but world being a system that we can place in front of the term citizen that brings us all up to the top level, you might say. Um, so this is why it was important for him to use that term. Um, Bob, you had mentioned the concern of Gary that he mentions about nation states not giving up their sovereignty. 
And I would have to say, over Gary's life, his viewpoint matured, certainly, as he met and read and more and, and learned more. Uh, but I think there was a kernel of that concern of the nation state throughout his, obviously, uh, the way they treated him uh, and the courage, like Simon was saying, that he had to have to deal with the, the frustrations of, of all the, the borders and everything. Um, but he would say, he said to me once, and I thought it was really a key thing. Uh, Gary said, I'm not a, opposed to nation states. I'm opposed to the anarchy between them. There's nothing wrong with nation states. We have those identities, whatever those identi identities are, linguistic, religious, national, and those are fine. We should be able to celebrate them and not fight over them. And that means creating law and legal institutions beyond them. And that's why we are talking about World Federation because it's creating those institutions of law, but not just the institutions of law, but that identity that we could uh, cherish. Uh, at that global level. So we have to start, uh, like uh, Carla May was saying, we have to repeat, repeat, repeat. We have to market why it's important to be or see ourselves uh, as, as world citizens and why the idea of world federation or that concept is so crucial that, that we need to bring it to the, to the global level. Um, so he, Gary felt, he, Bob, that we had to go to people. We had to go to the people and say, uh, we're, we're world citizens. And then they could, in a sense, have the power to force their government to, to make a change. Because if you just go to the governments, the, the people in power, the Putins and the Trumps and the Xi's or whoever, you may not, that may never happen. So we need to start with the people. Um, so Anisha, you talked about breaking the rules of, of society. Um, and any, I, I mean, Gandhi, for example, broke, broke rules, but he did it in a nonviolent way. Um, he did it in a peaceful way. And Gary, if you remember in the book, when he came across all those uh, uh, German or French, really, because it was occupied, French uh, police officers who were on their bicycle, bicycles, and uh, these, all these students from University of Strasbourg were going to come and, and try to back him up, but they had like sticks and other things. And he's like, no, you cannot, raise, you cannot raise a weapon, whether it's a stick or your arm or something. This all has to be peaceful, because the only kind of permanent change would only be peaceful. But you don't, you don't have to surrender your Indian citizenship to be a world citizen. In fact, Gary always said, nation states can prevent you from, on a horizontal level, having another citizenship. Like maybe you cannot be Indian and American or Indian and, and French, but they can't prevent you from going to a higher level beyond it. They have no authority at that level. So you can actually declare yourself a world citizen and I will be here as your lawyer to back you up. So <laughs> know that you can do that. But you're right. I agree. As a lawyer, we need a world treaty to make this happen, to make this effective. We need treaties are OK, uh, but we but they need to be made by a really a world parliament, not by just nation states who could flout them at any time. So I'm, I really appreciate that you've done research and, and writing on this. And, I, and I, I would like you to put the link to your writing in the chat if you could. Um, Dave, you had mentioned Anatomy of Peace. Anatomy of Peace was one of the reasons, besides Gary's brother, Bud, who was killed in Salerno on his battleship, Anatomy of Peace was really the impetus that caused Gary to say, I need to do something. I need to take action. Because his favorite a phrase from Anatomy of Peace was, um, there is no step, first step to world government. World government is the first step. And Gary once asked me this question, David, if a rabbit jumps halfway across the room every time it jumps, how long will it take to get to the other side of the room? Well, it'll never make it there if it's always jumping halfway to the other side of the room, even if it's an infinitesimal amount at the end. So you have to make that jump completely. And that's what Gary did by stepping out of the, the nation state system into a world system. Um, and he, you had to be creative, like, like uh, Simon said, you had to be creative and, and have courage. He had to, to, to do that and to take off the clothes of, of the state that he was so brainwashed and we, as we all are to, to support. Um, and of course, the UDHR is, is the basis for all the work that we do at World Service Authority. So Gail, like you're, you said, what you said is right. Uh, giving lip service to this is what leaders, national leaders do so much. This is why we need world leaders who won't just give lip service to it, but will support it. And, and all the work we do at, at World Service Authority is to support the Universal Declaration of, of Human Rights and all the documents like the World Passport is based on articles uh, 13 and six of the Declaration, the right to freedom of travel and the right to identify yourself as an individual with rights before the law. Um, it, it says everyone has the right to recognition everywhere uh, uh, as, a, as a person before the law. Everyone, that's all humanity. Everywhere, that's the earth. Um, 
And of course, Arthur mentioned some of the scientific basis behind the, the work that we're trying to do to, to make uh, uh, a reality, you know, this idealistic utopian goal of reality, putting science and, uh, and other ideas of amazing people, uh, we're us working, you know, seven billion heads are better than one, us human beings working together in, in a structured way to get to this uh, the kind of uh, uh, promised land of, of, of a united world that we want to get to. Um, and Bob, your, your friend, uh, your, the chair of your department, who was detained, I did finally, uh, not long after you told me that, we did talk, and, and I think he was over his anger and frustration. <laughs> but Gary did all, all of it by the time we talked. But Gary did say that when you carry a world passport or a world document, you are, in a sense, stepping out of that, that system. You are, like Anisha said, sort of breaking the rules of society. You become a human rights educator, a human rights activist. You have to demand a peaceful, polite, presentable, persuasive, and persistent way. I have like the 10 Ps of using the passport um, uh, to be able to do it uh, effectively. And, and um, you can't be shy. You can't be afraid. And you can't back down. I mean, when Gary would go into Canada um, with his world passport, they would say to him, oh, Mr. Davis, you know, we don't accept that. And his answer was, I do. You know, what could, what could they say to him saying, well, I accept it, you know? Um, so you have, to, you have to think about it in a, in a holistic way. And we can talk about Gary's gurus and, and looking at the world in a holistic way uh, during the next discussion of, of the book. Um, and uh, I love the idea of us doing a group action where we, we all come together, ha having our world passports at the airport. I think that's uh, a wonderful idea. And, and certainly um, the idea of, of, the, of a world uh, constitution and, and creating laws at the world level, I would say that our world citizenship movement is uh, a human and environmental rights movement to back up our, our innate rights, but also speak for the earth that can't speak for itself. And now, because I know we only have about three minutes left, uh, so I just, or two minutes, I just want to say um, about Barat's comment and now I can slow down, um, <laughs> it, that the, we're just a, a small or pale blue dot, like Carl Sagan uh, mentioned. And you can see, go to YouTube after today's uh, event here and, and go, uh, type in pale blue dot Carl Sagan. And it's really just like a two or three minute video, which really puts humanity and the earth in its place and all the national leaders and all that we're doing in the sco scope of the universe. And so I, I love that idea that, you know, the ultimate sort of truth for Gary is who are we in this big universe? And so I want to finish with um, a Dr. Seuss uh, book called Horton Hears a Who, which maybe all of you have read or maybe you read a long time ago. But the, the premise of Horton Hears a Who is there's this big elephant who has these big ears and the elephant can hear a lot. And he just, he finds this little dust speck that's sitting on top of a flower. And then he hears this little voice coming from the dust speck. And he tries to start convincing all his friends uh, in, the, in the community of animals where he's living on his planet, that he can hear some people in this little dust speck. But then there's these other people who say, oh, no, there can't be a, a whole group of people living on that dust speck. And they say, we're going to boil that dust speck. So Horton you know, speaks to the, the people on this little dust speck, the, the, their name, they're called the Who's. And they, he says, you have to let these other people who I'm living with, these other animals that I'm living with, know that you exist. So they put together this real long, big, tube. And finally, the littlest who in Whoville on the dust speck, uh, you know, yelled, we're here, we're here, we're here. Uh, and then and actually the, the sound of that, of her voice made it through, uh, through the atmosphere of the dust speck. And these other creatures actually heard and said, oh, we're really sorry. We didn't realize that a whole universe or a whole world could be living on that dust speck. And so the earth, we're like a desert island in the world right, in the whole universe, actually. And this is our only home. We have to protect it, not boil it, like we're doing with, with climate change, right? Or not, not kill it off, whether it's, uh, you know, not working together to resolve a pandemic or to resolve inequality or injustice. We have to say, and as Gary did as world citizens, we are here, we are here, we are here. Hey. Th thank you, David. I see Arthur yeah. wants to get a word in. We are at the end of our time, and I wanted to take some time to close. So, Arthur, if you could say yeah. what you want to say in 45 seconds or less, go for yeah. it. Well, thank you, everybody. It was fabulous. Uh, great parallel to Horton. Uh, the, uh, uh, the good news we found, just found is that through a lot of networking, the World is My Country will be uploaded to all the public broadcasting stations in the country this Human Rights Day 
December 10th anniversary during the 75th anniversary of the UN. Uh, but that doesn't mean the local stations will definitely run it. We're going to need to organize and get funding and everything to get, get, get underwriters for the program that help make sure that everyone in the country asks to have it shown in their market and that we get this shown very widely and invite everybody who sees the movie to also read the book. Thanks, everybody. Great. Thank you. And I, I want to thank David for doing such an excellent job at facilitating and for doing the impossible, answering all of our questions with perfect wisdom and clarity. So thank you, David. Also thanking Arthur and Melanie for all their work that, that they've been doing over the years to promote Gary Davis's work. And most of all, thank all of you for a fabulous conversation. Our next session will be in a month from now on Saturday the 14th, uh, same time, same station, and we'll see you all there. If the uh, co-leaders will stay on for a moment to debrief, I invite you to stay if you, if you can. And otherwise, have a great month. See you next month. Take care now. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.